Police are rarely prosecuted for shooting Coloradans. We go inside a rare case where it happened. The state wants more money to plow the roads. Did they forget winter happens? Hard numbers on how often Denver's pit bulls bite and what happens when they do. And talk about strength. Yeah, this was the first time I tried rock climbing. He didn't get into rock climbing until after he was paralyzed. That's next. When officers in Colorado shoot civilians, prosecutors almost always decide that those officers did the right thing. Nearly seven dozen of those shootings last year and one officer was charged. Our investigative reporter Chris Vanderveen looks at the case where prosecutors went after a law enforcement partner in Fort Lupton and a jury wanted no part of it. It's 16 days into January 2019. Officer Zachary Helbig is wearing a body camera and talking to a woman who tells him three things you need to know about a man she knows. One. He has a habit and he needs to quit it. What habit? He has a drug habit. Okay, what kind of drugs? Meth. Two. Does he have any weapons? He has knives. Three. He's on a death mission because his, his dad just died. His family don't want nothing to do with him. Seven minutes into the talk. There he is right there. She spots him. Officer Helbig gets in his car, drives a few blocks, gets out, and spots Sean Billinger. Hey, come here! Come here, stop! Stop! Come here! Stop! Let me see your hands! Show me your hands! Hey, stop! Right there, man! Stop! Stop! Stop, stop man! Hey, stop! Police, stop! Police, stop! Stop! Stop right there! When a team of local law enforcement leaders examined this video, they advised this was a crime. To a person, they all looked at me and, and Rob Miller, the assistant DA, and said, that's a bad shooting. District Attorney Michael Rourke sent the case to a grand jury, which decided on manslaughter. There's nothing in his hands. It's clear that his hands are empty at the time he's approaching an officer. Honestly, it started in this parking lot. Attorney Mallory Ravel represented Helbig at trial. We don't think that this was a head scratcher. This was a clear, um, justified shooting. Friday, a jury agreed and acquitted Helbig. A police officer hears someone's on a death mission. They don't know if that means they're suicidal, homicidal. They know it means danger. The body camera in this case proved pivotal, she said. Showed not just the shoot, but what happened leading up to it. Those three things. And that is why he is free today. Does he want to be an officer? I think so. I think he does. So Helbig has some obstacles to get over before that could happen. He's been on administrative leave from the Fort Lepton Police Department since the indictment. When asked if he should be a cop again, the district attorney Rourke said, quote, I have some concerns. Rourke does say he doesn't regret bringing the case forward, but acknowledged it could potentially hurt his relationship with other law enforcement officers moving forward. Kyle. And Chris, it's so interesting to hear a prosecutor acknowledge that, you know, because they have to weigh so many things when they decide whether or not they should they should bring a case. And he's acknowledging, well, I, I know it's good, it could cost me a relationship. And these are relationships that DAs across the state have on a day-to-day -day basis with lo local law enforcement agencies. He acknowledges this puts that somewhat at risk, but he felt like this was the decision he had to make. All right, Chris Vanderveen, thank you. You bet. Today's next question is about a bill being considered in the state legislature. It essentially is a make my day bill for businesses. It would allow business owners to use lethal force to protect their property, just as you can do at home in Colorado. Question is, has a business owner actually been charged for shooting an intruder under the current law? So funny, after we decided that we were going to ask that question today, we heard it come up during a committee hearing at the Capitol. The Republican sponsor of the bill, Shane Sandridge of Colorado Springs, was asked for evidence that businesses need a make my day law. And listen to this awkward sauce. Representative Sandridge, do you have any statistics or data on any business owners in Colorado who've been shot or attacked at their place of business and were unable to defend themselves? I can definitely, get, definitely if, if you um, have never heard of a, a business owner getting shot I can in Colorado, I can definitely give you that information. I was asking if you had any data or studies or, or evidence. Did you bring any with you today? Um, no, but, but, but like I said, if you want some evidence and some data over um, business owners getting victimized um, in our state, I can definitely get that for you if you're not aware. Left the receipts at home. We asked the Colorado District Attorney's Council if they had stats on any business owners being charged for shooting an intruder.
They said that the cases are not easily tracked by location. None of the lawyers there at the DA's council could remember a single case where a business owner was charged, but they did acknowledge it has probably happened somewhere at some point along the line. Denver's pit bulls in the city illegally were involved in 7% of last year's dog bites, 7%. But when you look at the dozen or so most serious attacks, pit bulls were involved in those more than any other breed. Denver's health department tracks reported dog bites. That's how we know you're more likely to be bitten in public than at home, more likely to be bitten by a stranger's dog. And most dog bites involve adults, not kids. Denver had 518 reported dog bites last year. 54 by Labrador Retrievers, 49 by German Shepherds, 42 by dogs classified as unknown breeds, 41 by American Bulldogs, and 38 by Pit Bulls. Because so few dog owners in Denver register their pets, because people are unlikely to register Pit Bulls anyway, it's tough to say how the 7% of bites that involve Pit Bulls compare to their overall percentage in the dog population. Though when you look at the most severe dog bites, what are called level 5, multiple deep bites, there were 11 of those attacks in Denver last year. Four of them involve Pit Bulls more than any other breed. Denver Mayor Michael Hancock used his first ever veto to prevent a repeal of the pit bull ban. City Council is one vote shy of what they would need to override the mayor on this. It's not going to happen tonight. They may try to take it up next week. Edgewater is also talking about dogs and how they interact with people. The Edgewater Public Market announced this week it will no longer allow dogs in its food hall, blamed state health regulations. Well, those regulations haven't changed since the Edgewater Public Market in no November opened up, so we are curious about the details. And if you're wondering why dogs would be allowed in a food hall at all, it's because state health inspectors cannot regulate the common areas in the food hall, just the individual business areas. So Edgewater Public Market is allowed to have dogs in the common areas. They told us today the real issue is they just couldn't manage all the dogs in there. So perhaps you've heard the state legislators are considering a new law that would allow dogs on restaurant patios across the state, provided the restaurant's okay with it. The bill that passed in the Senate is now waiting in the House would require a separate patio entrance for the dogs, and they couldn't be off leash on the patio. It's pretty similar to Denver's current rules. There is snow on the way tomorrow, and CDOT could use a few bucks to keep plowing. Guys, this is not unexpected. It's winter time. Our Marshall Zellinger found out why CDOT's maintenance team is asking for more money in what's sometimes a futile effort to keep the interstates open. You may not realize it, but when CDOT plows a road, they're also plowing away tens of millions of dollars. The projection right now is 15.4 million to the end of our snow season. CDOT needs 15.4 million more than previously budgeted for snow and ice removal this winter. But according to Interim Maintenance Director Mike Goolsby, our winter is not the same as CDOT's winter. We budget through a snow season that basically is from October 8th to May 5th. That's actually pretty close this year. Our first major storm hit October 10th. This spreadsheet that will be presented to CDOT commissioners on Wednesday details the bad news. The bottom line is this. The maintenance team asked for $86 million this year and needs to ask its parents, CDOT's commissioners, for $15 million more from the piggy bank. Overtime costs for our folks, uh, additional materials. Um, it could be avalanche control. Last year, it was the avalanches that forced CDOT to ask for $19 million more than expected. This year, it's making sure those same areas don't slide again, on top of plowing all the snow on major corridors like I-70 and I-25. We still have to move commerce and we still have to move the economy in the state, and, that, and it does cost more to do that on the interstates than it does in some of the rural areas. If you're thinking, like I did, CDOT is really bad at budgeting. I'm told this is more like putting money in one account to pay bills and another account to save money in case of emergency. We have a checking account that we use for snow removal, and when we need to, we dip into savings occasionally. The savings account is a great way to keep that money there for a rainy day, or in this case, a snowy day. I picture the scene from Oliver where CDOT goes to the commissioners. May I have 15 million more? 
It's an interesting process since CDOT divides the state into sections, as you saw in that spreadsheet, Durango, Pueblo, Aurora. Each section estimates what it needs, but the money is essentially kept in one central place and allocated as needed. And so what I thought was over budget, which it kind of is over budget, yeah. is defended as saying, look, we keep the money here. It's known we're probably going to use it. But instead of putting it in this account, we keep it over here. I just want to know if they're keeping so much money over here, does that mean we're being overcharged on certain things? Or could that money be used in other parts of CDOT instead of just sitting there waiting to be used on really snowy years? There's got to be a reason why they play that game, why they squirrel the money away over there and then dole it out and dole it out and dole it out. Somebody out there knows and write in and tell me and Marshall because we, we don't know how the game is played, but there's got to be a reason. There's no way it's being done on accident. All right, we're going to find Marshall. out. His climbing style, by necessity, is all upper body strength. Oh yeah, my arms were completely shot at that point. The video is just the start of his story. And Rod Blagojevich, walking out of federal prison in Colorado, gives us all a blueprint on how we too can get a presidential pardon. Next. A transplant will be leaving Colorado and moving back home to Illinois soon. His name is Rod Blagojevich. You probably know him from Celebrity Apprentice. The former contestant had his sentence commuted by the former host today. The President Trump gave the old Illinois governor, who's in federal prison, Jefferson County, a break for his attempt to sell President Obama's Senate seat. Our Steve Tager happened to be working for a station in Illinois when Blago reported to prison in 2012. There's little Stevie on the TV visiting Colorado to talk about the ex-gov going to jail. And there's big Stevie on the TV today doing the exact same thing as Blago gets out of FCI Inglewood. 
So, Steve, it occurs to me that if anybody wants a blueprint on how to get a pardon or commutation from President Trump, Blago has laid it out. There is a pattern to follow, Kyle. Here you go. Step one, you appear on a reality show with the president. Step two, you have a story that's relatively relatable to the president. And then step three, get yourself a camera, a microphone, and the attention of the president's favorite news channel. It's, a, it's an event. It's deja vu for a neighborhood in Jefferson County. The cameras are back, the chopper is flying, and the wait for a celebrity inmate who's been their neighbor for eight years is on. I used to drive to work every day and I would wave and say hi and good morning. President Trump made it clear today he's been listening to Rod Blagojevich's plea. I watched his wife on television. Dave McKinney is an investigative reporter for WBEZ in Chicago. He is also the host of Public Official A, a podcast detailing the rise and fall of Blago. It's not surprising he did it, but you know, we're, we're, there, there's sort of this stunned feeling in Chicago today about it really happened. Rod's wife, Patty, made countless appearances on Fox News, telling a story the president can relate with about an investigation into wrongdoing and law enforcement who seemed determined to take him down. Uh, it was a prosecution by the same people, Comey, Fitzpatrick, the same group. Hearing those names, that, that just ran parallel to what Patty was doing repeatedly on Fox News. It probably didn't hurt that Blago was on Celebrity Apprentice briefly, but as long as you can get the president's ear and tell a compelling story, perhaps today shows us you might get another shot. And I know that you typically make the rec recommendations, Kyle, but if I could make a recommendation, you should listen to Public Official A. It's pretty darn good. It's a podcast available wherever you get podcasts. Anyway, we are outside here, outside of FCI Inglewood, just waiting to see what happens and see if there will be the same pomp and circumstance as the last time Rod Blagojevich was near that door. That time he was going in nearly eight years ago. This time he will be coming out a free man. So this is, vi this is really different than most stakeouts that you do as a journalist, Steve, because most of the time you are hoping to catch a fleeting glimpse of somebody with your camera. But this is Rob Blagojevich, so if you just have the camera, he will come running towards <laughs> it like a moth to a flame. It's, it's almost like just, just kind of putting the fishing line out and just waiting. Our, our assumption is, is that he will see this line of cameras and just walk right up to it. Sure. I will tell you, the man has never seen a camera he doesn't like. Sure. I can say that from experience. So well, and after we'll some years on the inside, he might be especially thirsty for attention tonight or tomorrow whenever he gets out. All right. Big Stevie in the TV. Thank you. Nice to see the sun for a short time today. We're in between storm systems. The next round of snow will be here this time tomorrow night. Our high at 33 should be in the mid 40s. We'll get there eventually. There's been some leftover snow shower activity south of the metro area all afternoon. National Weather Service is putting out a winter weather advisory tomorrow into Thursday for those same areas of southern Colorado extending up into central Nebraska. No advisories for snow or travel for Denver, but we are looking at about an inch, maybe two of snow by early Thursday morning. Tonight, no issues. Drive times, great. I-25, I-70, no issue. Tomorrow morning, you're just fine. Tomorrow afternoon, the snow picks up, goes overnight, tapers off about 3 o'clock in the morning on Thursday. And again, it looks like about 1 to 2 inches in Denver, up to Fort Collins with 2 to 4, above 6,500 feet in central Jefferson County and Douglas County. Not tonight, dry and cold are low at 17 with partly cloudy skies. Tomorrow, mostly cloudy, 30 degrees. Snow showers in the afternoon, lingering through the evening into the early part of Thursday. Thursday will be clearing. We start off Thursday morning with a temperature of 11, get to 35, and then the payoff is the weekend sunshine with highs near 50 Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then you guessed it, Monday and another round for snow. I actually started screaming, I'm paralyzed, I'm never going to walk again. He has come to gain new strength, uncommon strength. We'll go climbing with him next.
The video is an ode to upper body strength, and the backstory is a tribute to toughness. Take a look. William Sheremet was paralyzed in a motocross crash a few years ago. He recently decided to give rock climbing a go. This is his first time doing it. My name is William Sheremet, and I've had kind of a crazy life. In 2013, I was in a motocross accident. I went off a jump, crashed. Someone was right behind me, couldn't get out of the way, smashed into me, and I was paralyzed instantly. That was a, a pretty life-changing moment for me. Uh, this was on the Mississippi River. I've tried quite a few things after my accident. Um, I've done some mountain biking, some kayaking. I'm filming, bro. This past weekend, I had some friends of mine, and they encouraged me to go rock climbing with them. I decided to go, and I, I was pretty skeptical that I would be able to do it even, because all I have is my upper body, my legs don't work at all, I have no core strength, so I was like, I don't know how this is gonna work, but they kept pushing me, so I finally uh, decided to do it. Dude, you got this. Once I got started, it was more like this feeling of I can do this. I didn't think I would get all the way to the top, but I, I just trusted that it would work and kept going, and eventually I just made it there. Will, you're an animal. <laughs> It was almost a symbolic moment where I had gone through this incredible suffering. I mean, this injury hasn't been easy by any means, but through that, I've found a lot of joy. Well, you are an animal. In feedback, few of you think that we are off base to question how CDOT holds plow funds in reserve. Mandel says they can't simply wait for the state to get around to approving new money.